Amen. So this morning, we have a very special uh, speaker. We got Brian Wills up here, all right? Yeah, and I love Brian. Um, Brian, when I first uh, joined, started joining the staff here at Life Church, I sat down with Brian because uh, Brian uh, had a similar role at a church in Southern California, and I don't think he had any idea that I was thinking about going on staff here as a pastor. And I sat down and t- chatted with him over coffee, and when I left, I was like, man, I got this guy in my corner. Like, and, he, and he can relate to any struggles I might have over the coming years as I step out in faith in this new position. And, and I, say, I say that for anybody who's been around Brian, like, there's this sense of, like, this guy's for me. And I love that. And, and he has been such a help for me as I've stepped into this role, uh, just in s- taking loads off my plate as, as uh, I need them, and, and also supporting me and encouraging me. And we always joke that we're, like, very similar in stature. And he even put the headset on. I, I preached last week. He put the headset on this morning and was like, oh, it fits perfectly. And I'm like, imagine that. That was my – I wore it yesterday. And so uh, I love that, but he does all sorts of things around here, helps out filling in with announcements, helps his wife Heidi with Life Kids, and uh, you might be feeling this year that there's this, this undercurrent of discipleship starting to bubble up here at Life Church, and really that is because of this guy and the work he's put into just our discipleship model here at Life Church in the past year or so, and so I... I have no qualms, no worries about coming to the pulpit today, and it's an honor to uh, have you here and just your servant heart. And so give him a round of applause as he takes over this morning. Thanks, Bob. So I had this amazing introduction all set, and that was it. So it went well. Um, let's see. The only thing I'll mention that he didn't mention was the reason I go to Life Kids so much, I love the kids. They're amazing. But my wife is the kids director, so it kind of works out well for me. Um, So, you know. Yeah, right? So, um, but yeah, and super excited about all the conversations we're able to have right now about discipleship. It's really fun to partner with the staff and and with Pastor Jeff to think about, like, what does that look like for us? And so we've got a lot of really exciting things. I think we're going to, you know, God's really moving in this. And there's a lot of, like, aha moments that are showing up for us. All right, well, if you're like me, you really like to be planned out and know where we're going to go. So if, you're, if that's you, you can get your Bible out and go to Acts chapter 9, 43. That's where we're going to start. So before we do that, though, for the rest of us that don't need time to plan, Acts chapter 10 is what we're going to talk about. And Acts chapter 10 is really important. It's a strategic and important chapter, really for the, in the overall picture of God's story, because it's where the Gentiles are able to receive the gospel and welcome into the church. This is like the first step. So uh, we're kind of at a breakthrough moment, so, so be ready. So let's talk a little bit about Jews and Gentiles before we get into it. So when we talk about Jews, we're talking about the first believers were Jewish. That's important to know, right? And Jews also were, um, there was a lot of prejudice between the two groups. They didn't really get along or, you know, they kind of talked about they a lot, you know, the us versus they kind of mentality. The world was really divided into two groups at that time. You had the Jews that lived a very, like, unique, set-apart type way of living according to a lot of the Older Testament uh, rules and laws. So if you think about, like, Leviticus, super excited book to read through, and you get to hear all the rules, 613 rules. But they lived a really called out and unique way. It was very different than anyone else. And they worshipped one God. That really made them unique. And then the rest were Gentiles. And there was a lot of different variation in what that could look like. But it always included usually multiple gods and just a very different framework. So you could just start, are you starting to see they're very different from one another and uh, did not get along so well. Jesus was a Jew. And the early Christians were Jewish, which is important for us to know. But we know that the gospel's for the whole world. So, like, how do we get from here to there? That's the question. So, Mark 16, 15, I think, has something that's really important for us to remember, right? So, um, he said to them, and this is mentioning Jesus, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Emphasis on the all. And... um, that just starts to clue us in, and I could have gone through many scriptures that point to that same thing. 
up until this point, the apostles really, they hadn't like formally and officially gone out and preached to Gentiles at all. So they were really more focused on the Jewish people preaching in synagogues and where you would find Jewish folks. That was what was happening. So a Gentile might have heard the gospel, but it was more like just like a byproduct of like a walker by or something like that. It wasn't that they would have really been officially shared the gospel or welcomed in the church. So last week, Pastor Bob did a great job of wrapping up chapter 9. So if you remember, um, this was about Dorcas who was rose from the dead, right? God raises her from the dead through Peter. Um, and he, now we're in Joppa. So he was asked to come to Joppa. So that's kind of where we're gonna where we're gonna start. So chapter 9, verse 43. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon, a tanner of hides. So that's where we ended it. And there's a couple things that I wanted to mention before we, we get into our text, which is uh, verse 1 through 10. So Joppa is about 40 miles west of Jerusalem, and it's a port city, which is important to know. So it's on the sea, Mediterranean Sea. Jerusalem obviously being a very important city with prominent people, and of course a need to get like materials and, and things two of them, um, Joppa was like the pathway. So oftentimes boats would bring things, um, materials, it would come into Joppa and it would get transported by land into Jerusalem. So that's kind of what Joppa's deal was at the time. So someone like King Solomon, for example, his boats would come and go from there. And then, and I love this, um, if you're familiar with Jonah and the big fish, right? Uh, so this is where Jonah left from Joppa. So he went to Joppa, and then he went to Sarsis. She was supposed to go to Nineveh. That's a whole other story, but, but that's what, what Joppa is. So the apostle Peter, he's in Joppa. Of course, Peter is one of the closest disciples of Jesus, right? He followed him through his three-year ministry, and he was actually on the inner circle. So James, John, and Peter had opportunity to see things or experience things that even the rest of the apostles didn't. And so, if you think of it from that perspective, there was a preparation starting with Peter and the others as well. Following Jesus that closely would definitely prepare you for whatever's to come. He was often the spokesman or kind of a representative of the group. He was the one that sometimes spoke first and acted afterwards. He was bold, courageous, but, so, but he was often like the lead, right? a lead person, right? And he played a very prominent role um, that we're going we're gonna to read about. And, of course, he played a key role in building the church across um, that we'll, we'll continue on with. So he's in Joppa with Tanner, with a Tanner named Simon. So a Tanner is a leather maker, right? So that his business was making leather. And back then, they'd make tents with it or sandals, saddles, um, clothing, these kind of things. And what they do is they take the hide of a dead animal, right? And then they treat it with chemical usually, and then it would become leather, so you could imagine it's probably not the best smelling thing in the world, right? Kind of makes sense. So uh, people avoided tanners. One, it was the smell. So if, if people didn't avoid them for the smell, they would avoid them because it, what they were doing was it was a, it, the dead animals were a violation of the Levit Levitical law. They just couldn't do it, right? So people would avoid the tanners for lots of reasons. So Peter stay with Simon. It's kind of a head scratcher a little bit because it's like, why would he do that, right? So he, he, at some sense, was trying to follow after what he was uh, modeled by Jesus, but he didn't quite have the whole picture, or at least we're going to find out he doesn't have the whole picture of what God's up to. So let's start off in chapter ten, verse one. In Caesarea, there lived a Roman army officer named Cornelius, who was a captain of the Italian regiment. He was a devout, God-fearing man. As was everyone in his household, he gave generously to the poor and prayed regularly to God. One afternoon, about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he saw an angel of God coming toward him. Cornelius, the angel said. Cornelius stared at him in terror. What is it, sir? He asked the angel. And the angel replied, your prayers and gifts to the poor have been received by God as an offering. Now send some men to Joppa and summon a man named Simon Peter. He is staying with Simon, a tanner who lives near the seashore. As soon as the angel was gone, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier, one of his personal attendants. He told them what had happened and sent them off to Joppa. So Cornelius was a Roman centurion, like a military leader. 
of a unit of around 100 men. And he's in Caesarea, which is like the, the headquarters for the Roman op- occupation. He was devout and God-fearing, meaning he put a lot of effort into rejecting the pagan religions that were commonplace around him. So it's important that we picture Cornelius as like an intentional effort to reject. If you think about our common culture, there's things that are like right in, you could just walk right into that way, right? And as Christians, there's some things we make decisions about, but we have to be deliberate, right? It doesn't just come natural. So that's what we see him doing. He wasn't a full-fledged convert to Judaism, but he believed in one God like the Jews did, and he respected their moral and ethical teaching. So there's a level of like reverence or respect, but he was like kind of caught in between. So even though he had those thoughts and those were his actions, he was still a Gentile. He wasn't a Jew. He feared God with all his house. So if you picture, you know, you think of your family or your friend groups, you know, you, you put a lot of effort into like the rest, right? And it takes, you know, encouragement and pointing them to God. Like he's putting effort in with his family. So it's not just him, it's his whole family. He gave gifts to the poor and he prayed regularly. So I'm kind of emphasizing all this just to show that he's being very deliberate and action oriented, right? So he's hungry, right? You can tell he's like, he believes in the God of Israel, he respects the Jews, but he's not really official and he needs to be saved. And he hasn't heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he's kind of in this this tough spot, right? So I can actually relate to this in terms of like that hunger and, and feeling that way. Um, so for me, growing up, I didn't get a ton of exposure to the gospel. It wasn't, I didn't grow up in youth group. I didn't, like, wasn't in the kids' church, you know. Um, when I was younger, my parents weren't believers, so I, 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 just, I didn't know much. Um, in my early 20s, I made a lot of, well, a lot of poor choices led me up to this place, and poor health kind of really got me in my early 20s, and I started searching for answers. And what's really interesting is my search for answers shifted into my hunger for God. So it's like I started with my head and I was thinking about why is the world like this? There's got to be more to it, you know, and then it like moved into like my heart. So it's an interesting process. Um, And so as a teen, I really only had, my only exposure to the gospel was Christmas and Easter and I mostly was like kind of drugged into, you know, dragged into to do that and I wasn't really that motivated, but, but I knew enough to know that when I was at this hard place, there was more to life than just kind of like me and what's going on. So God was already preparing me, even through showing up to church when I didn't think I was really paying attention that much. So God was preparing my heart. And I came home after college. This was my second year of college. And like most first or second year college students, you go live with your parents in the summer because you get food, free food. Your laundry might not get made for you, but at least you have a place to make do your laundry. And, you know, all those things. So that's what I did. I was at, you know, spring semester was over. I, I was in Texas at the time. I moved home. And the first thing I did was I, you know, dropped my bags in the guest room, I guess, you know, my old room. And I did something that I didn't expect I was going to do. I called the pastor of our local church. Can't really tell you why I did that other than I knew that I had nowhere else to turn. So I call him. He answers. And I kind of just start spilling over all my challenges. And he's like, hey, can I just come visit with you? So it's midday, I'm at my parents' house, they're both at work, I'm a college student, so I've got time. He comes out, and he lays out the gospel for me. They're in the living room, right? And I am all in, right there. And it was very interesting, the way in which he communicated to me was exactly the way I needed to hear it. He talked about how I had like a hole in me I'm trying to fill, and I'm only going to fill that with Jesus. But I hadn't really told him that, so I just knew that I had a hole. So it was just very interesting that he used that, and then he laid out the gospel. It was like my entry. And so it was just God constantly preparing me. What I realized is that um, I think he was getting prepared too beforehand to, to talk to me. So I'm reminded of Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God desires a relationship with people, would you say? desires people. Desires is a very important word. He isn't like, you know, is okay with it. He desires it. He wants it. And we're talking about one that doesn't really need anything, right? Cornelius had set his heart and his mind on God, right? You can just, the way I described him, right? He is going after it. He was seeking the Lord. For those that really want to know God, he will show themselves and reveal himself to them. 
So let's look at verse 5. This is an interesting one. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. This one is a head scratcher for me. So we have an angel that sent to give a message from God, but he doesn't really give a message. All his messages is go get someone else that's going to give the message. And for me, it's kind of like, if you're an angel, you just came from God, you surely know who Jesus is, right? Um, You're highly capable. You could just share the message. I mean, Cornelius is right there. And why not, right? And so I think that one is a head scratcher, but it's actually a pretty easy answer. It's because God has chosen that the gospel be preached by sinners who've been saved, right? We talk about like the, the word of our testimony and the power of it. A lot of it's because we're sinners that have been saved. We can, you know, it's relatable, it undeniable, you know, what God has done, you, you can't refute that, right? And so I think that God's chosen to use us. And what an adventure, like, I mean, for, especially for those of you that are like, yes, adventure people, like, let's go. What better opportunity, right? So God wants to use you, he wants to use me, and he wants to use us to tell other people about Jesus. I think that's really quite amazing. So we've covered verse 1 through 8 so far, and we're going to make a shift. So verse 1 through 8 is God preparing Cornelius to receive or hear the gospel. We're going to make a shift now, and we're going to finish 9 through 23, and we're going to get into God preparing Peter to share the gospel with Cornelius. So you're probably starting to see this connection of like, oh, God's going to work in at both ends here. So let's start out in verse 9. The next day as Cornelius' messengers were nearing the town, Peter went up on the flat roof to pray. It was about noon, and he was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. So we're on the coast in Joppa. They have flat roofs is a pretty typical thing back then. And they're a place to like go and spend time, relax, and so forth. On the seashore, right, because the tanners have to be by the seashore. That's the rules. And they probably have a nice breeze up there. It's noontime. Peter's hungry, the meal's being prepared, he's praying. I just couldn't help but picture him praying and then getting the smell of this, right? So we're going to have a pop quiz real quick. So I went online and I thought, what are the best smelling, what would people say are the best smelling foods? Maybe bacon, maybe not. (laughs) Maybe, what else comes to mind? Maybe like pie brownies. So number 10 was pie, right? So you guys got your number one in your mind? We'll see who wins out. I'm going to skip to number five. Someone asked actually earlier, where was pizza? I think pizza was seven. (laughs) Number five was popcorn. And in our household, uh, popcorn would be number one. Yeah, my wife is a firm believer that popcorn is a very amazing thing, and our whole of our kids are on board. And, and popcorn isn't just for movies. No, no, popcorn's like bedtime, anytime. Br- breakfast, yeah, like in bed, reading books to Nash, you know, five-year-old guy, eating popcorn. <laughs> Number four, coffee. Yeah, coffee, mm-hmm. Number three is barbecued meats. Walk by someone, got a brisket going, Okay. Number two is fresh baked cookies. Got some chocolate chip cookies in the oven. You open it up. Yep. Number one, someone was so smart to guess this already, bacon. (laughs) Bacon. And it's not just the smell. Uh, They're only talking about smell here, but the sizzle also. Just everything about bacon, let's just agree, is pretty amazing, right? So not sure what they were cooking downstairs. Probably wasn't bacon, but thought it would be fun to talk about bacon. All right, let's pick up back in our text here. So we're going to go to verse 11. Let's see. So he saw the sky open, and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners, and the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat them. No, Lord, Peter declared, I have never eaten anything that our Jewish laws have declared impure or unclean. And pay attention to this one. But the voice spoke again, do not call something unclean if God has made it clean. The same vision was repeated three times, typical Peter. Then the sheet was suddenly pulled up to heaven. Peter was very perplexed. What could the vision mean? 
Just then the men sent by Cornelius found Simon's house. Standing outside the gate, they asked if a man named Simon Peter was staying there. Meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, Three men have come looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. It's a pretty specific message. So if he didn't get it, like, on the trance part of it all, and, like, he's definitely getting the message now, like, he needs to be okay with these Gentiles coming his direction. So Peter went down, and he said, I'm the man you're looking for. Why have you come? They said, we were sent by Cornelius, a Roman officer. He is a devout and God-fearing man, well-respected by all the Jews. A holy angel instructed him to summon you to his house so that he can hear your message. So Peter invited the men to stay for the night. The next day, he went with them, accompanied by some of the brothers from Joppa. So did you catch the end there? He invites them in. He would never have done that prior to this experience. Right? He would have been like, Gentiles, come, I can't even go to your house. He'd probably want them to stay at the gate. He might say, maybe I'll meet you like somewhere else, but that might even be a stretch. But something had happened with Peter, right? And he had gotten the message. And I think it's really good to see that like God spoke to Peter and what would make sense for him. He was hungry at the time. He, of course, was Jewish. So, like, this whole sheet thing actually makes a lot of sense. So, the point is that God handles the preparation. Here we see God prepare Peter, and before he had, he had prepared Cornelius. He brings the two together. So, if God calls you to minister to your neighbor, bring them a pie or bacon, um, you know, go pray for someone, get up here and speak, like, whatever it is, Right? You can have confidence that God's going to kind of work things on both ends. Right? I mean, imagine how hard it would be if we didn't think God was working at all and it was up to us. Like, that would be not great, especially if you like spend some time reflecting on how your inside is like, this is not a good thing. But God does. Right? And so going back to my story, there I am in the living room, right? and I say yes. Um, what I didn't really know at the time was people had been praying with me, praying for me beforehand. So you know, there was intervention then, and God was working and preparing me. So, you know, if, if you ever have this thought that, like, God doesn't really speak to people that don't know Jesus, maybe think again, because it might look a little different, but that's how, you know, the Holy Spirit counsels and guides, right, people to truth. And so there's, like, this preparation that happens, and that was what was going on for me. I couldn't place it. At the time, I remember thinking it was like God was knocking on the door of my heart, but I couldn't describe it to anyone, like, before I know Jesus. But then when I became a believer, and then afterwards realized that people were praying for me, it's like it all came together, and I'm like, oh, I was having an experience with God. I just didn't know it. It just, you know, I couldn't place it. So when I sought the Lord, I was prepared, but I made the phone call, and there was a messenger on the other end that had also been prepared. So God works at both ends. So back to Peter's vision. So verse 11, he saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners. In the sheet were all sorts of animals, reptiles, and birds. Then a voice said to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. So this big vision comes down, right? The vision happens, the sheet comes down. And of course, as a reminder, these are the Le Leviticus would say, you can't do that, right? Peter's initial response is no. Um, what I think is interesting is that Peter's actually at a tanner's house. So, you know what is that Tanner's house is? Dead animals. So, he's like in this like animal like immersive experience, right? Like I'm picturing Disneyland or something because they're really good at immersive experiences. It makes me think of my uncle, surprisingly. So, my uncle is the ultimate outdoorsman. Uh, he lives in a small northern California town. There's like a lake and all these mountains around, right? And if someone, you know, goes and hikes these mountains and they get lost they will call him, like the, the local service will know to call him, and he's the person that they dispatch to go find them, and he treks up there and has a way. So it's amazing, right? Yeah. He's also a um, phenomenal hunter and fisherman. He grew up his whole life like hunting and fishing, and, and I can relate because my son, our 13-year-old, is like a fishing like junkie, and he can fish all day. He fish, he'll fish longer than I will. I'll run out of gas, and he'll keep going. Um, 
But if you go to my uncle's house, because of all the hunting and fishing, it's an immersive experience. You know, he's got the basic stuff, like on the wall, there's like a buck, you know, a, th a three point or whatever. He's got, you know, elk, maybe an antelope even. But then it goes further. He has like all these taxidermy animals, like where they stuff them and place them, you know. So like he has a coffee table of a fox. There's a bobcat and like, you know, uh, different pheasants and different things. And there's a gun like in every single room. So like, he, you know, he always gets like, you know, lectured by his wife that like before we show up to visit, got to get the guns. At least unload them or if nothing else, put them in a safe. But if you walk around, it'll be like a bathroom and you open a door and you're like, oh, there's a 22. There it is. It's just in case, you never know, right? You just never know when you're going to need it. So anyways, reminding, this, this totally reminds me of it. And this is also the same uncle that catches rattlesnakes for fun. So he likes to go out warm evening in the summer, and he'll go and find a rattlesnake, and he'll catch it. Like with a stick, you know, get a stick, and he has a way to whatever. So his wife tells a story where he brought one home in a huge, like, cookie jar, glass cookie jar, like, you know, this big. And it was on the kitchen table, a live rattlesnake. And she's like, of course it had to go. Um, but I mentioned that uh, our 13-year-old son kind of follows in his footsteps. So apparently they've already decided that next summer they're going to be going hunting rattlesnakes in the summer. So I, I nominated Heidi to go. She <laughs> is not on board yet. But I'm not and so sure I'm going to, you know, I want to be father-son. But that one sounds a little sketchy to me. So the sheet is coming down, right? All these animals he can't eat. Why would God show him that of all things, right? Just, it doesn't really make sense, right? Well, God was showing Peter that he was including the Gentiles in the gospel, right? In other words, the animals represented the Gentiles, and God was saying, what you're saying is impure and unclean is not. Because, right, remember, the Jews rejected the Gentiles. It wasn't just like, you guys are... You, we want, it's very different than I think the way we look at it in church these days, right? We're like, we actually want to make a space for people to come in, and hopefully, and here they're like repelled by them, and God's flipping the script on them um, big time. And so in verse 15, it says, do not call something unclean, which God has made clean. So part of the preparation for Peter, this is a big part of it, right? Like God's getting his attention. So a spoiler alert here that uh, Peter is going to preach the gospel, and you'll probably hear that in a future week, and amazing things are going to happen in Acts 10, and then the apostles are going to wrestle with how do we get the gospel to all the world and all Gentiles, right? They're going to wrestle with that too, but this is like domino number one, right? God loves all people. Would you agree? He shows no partiality. His will is that all people who believe will receive salvation. We must do the same. I think even though I just mentioned that, like, as Christians, we like to bring people in. I mean, there's parts of our lives, maybe in our neighborhood, maybe where we work, wherever it is, that we can easily start to get a little insulated and think about ourselves, right? And we definitely don't want to despise anybody or think ourselves better, right? We certainly saw the Jews doing it, right? So it's a good um, reminder of, of how the Lord wants us to be postured. Romans 10, 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. So these two verses, there's lots of them, but those two definitely make the point that the gospel is for all. And it's because God really desires all people to be saved. And he made a way for it to happen. He didn't just talk about it, think about it, like he put action to it, right? God desires to be in fellowship with people, but he knows that our sinful condition creates a barrier, a gap, right? So he brought Jesus to bridge that gap right? And, and it's through Jesus that we can be one and, and be with the Father, right? So it's, it's the perfect remedy, right? There's no way we could have paid the debt otherwise. So now all have the opportunity to believe in Jesus and be saved, no matter what we look like, no matter our age, no matter our education level, no matter what country we're from, 
no matter what we've done in the past, right? The gospel is for all, and Jesus has paid the price that works for everyone that says yes. That's our coworkers, it's our friends, it's our family, it's our neighbors, uh, it's also our enemies, people that really get under our skin. Sometimes those are actually the people that are God most wants us to go towards. Most opportunity for growth for us, for sure. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That is amazing news, would you say? Amazing news. Let's tell other people, let's be bold and tell them the good news and know God's going to work it on both ends and prepare us and them, right, whoever we're going to be with. I think, I think that's the word for us today, and, and um, I just want to close in prayer. So, Lord Jesus, I just thank you, God, that you have made a way, that you've bridged the gap, that you've made a way for us to be with you, that we were once so separated from you, Lord, but we can now be made whole, experience freedom in this life, and eternal salvation, and it's through only through you that we can do that. And it just means we just say yes. We accept your gift, and we believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. I just thank you for this message, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to help us process it. And we just know, Holy Spirit, that you've been preparing us as we before we even got here, and you're going to help us as we go process through this and, and live our lives according to uh, your word. And just thank you for who you are. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go red team.